the scriptures pertaining to Jesus and his conversation with people. Now, you know, we was here this morning, every one of us was debating what we think and what this. Well, whenever they stood before Jesus in his time, everybody had their say. But when Jesus spoke, that was the authority. And they even marveled that he spoke as one having authority, not as the scribes had already been and all of that. So some of the scriptures I find for you this morning will be found in the 8th chapter of the book of St. John. And again, I don't know just what's going to be said because I'm going to try to use a verse here and then I'm going to try to relate to it. John chapter 8, verse 41. Now the church is a body of Christ made up of baptized believers. And where did we all come from? I can tell you, in case you don't know, and maybe you've already saw this, but the church is not usually made up of rich people. Church is not normally made up of great people. Church is usually made up of people that are on a low level, or a lot of them are even outcasts. And that's what makes it a little bit hard for people to see the church being as great as it is because it's made up of such a low class of people. <clears throat> you know, there's not that many educated. I could go over there to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1st chapter, and read that down through there for you. But not many mighty men, not many noble men are called. You remember reading that? And on down through there, and about the wisdom of men and all of that. Well, it seems like we are the group by the scriptures, and that is just us as a level of people that we are. I don't think any of us has got any national records. None of us have any uh, history that is worth probably turning back and reading into or anything like that. But this is what the scribes and the Pharisees had to say about Jesus. And of course, he was the most choice person that ever lived, wasn't he? Ye do the deeds of your father. This was a conclusion of what Jesus had just said. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Now that was their opinion, wasn't it? They had the opinion that Christ, Jesus, was born of fornication. Because the history would make you baby believe that if you were just to take it as it is written. But you've got to get the Bible knowledge of it and understanding of it. And the prophecy from the 14th, I believe the seventh chapter of the book of uh, Isaiah and all of that. So we have a church made up of this kind of people. You know, you go back into the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, and you read back there where Lot had those two children, and he had laid with them, and then they had children, and then it said that they would not enter into the congregation of Israel until the seventh, or, or, until the tenth generation. But after they did enter in and after time rolled on and as you trace the history back Jesus was part of that family lineage also in Judah where he there had uh, disguised himself or though the harlot had disguised herself and she had conceived and she bore a child and you trace the lineage of Jesus back and they come through those people so you can just find all of this and that's where everybody ought to feel good enough to be in the family of God. No matter what your birth has been, don't matter your nationality, don't matter the circumstances, you know, I, I'd like to throw this in because I have a feeling of it. We used to have that so much talk of predestination, and it got in our churches, and then it was people got to believe in it, and then they got to teaching it, and they got to teaching it contrary even to scriptures. And the first thing we knew, there was a lot of people that just separated because of that. And they come to my house one time and wanted to debate the matter. Well, I had to think pretty good. How am I going to satisfy these people? And I said, well, in this case, if you believe just what you're saying, we cannot even criticize these illegitimate children that are being born all over the world because that's what it's going to be anyway. So if it's going to be anyway, even though it's wrong, we have nothing to say about it because it's already determined. 
That is not, I don't believe, the teaching of the Bible. The Bible teaches against it, so it won't be, but it does happen. Even though it does happen, that doesn't exclude the person as being an individual. They are still an individual. They have a soul. They need to be saved. They need to hear the Word of God. They need to realize that they are a person. They need to realize that they can become of the family of God. It says, all... <clears throat> He gave unto them power to believe upon him, you know, would become the sons of God, even as to those that believed upon his name. So here this was a bunch of people. I'd like to read down through there for you, and I notice sometimes I read a lot <clears throat> in the sermon part. But I'd like for you to see both sides of it, because just like we said in the lesson, which side are you on? I will not be on the side of the Pharisees. I would like to be and stay on the side that Jesus taught right on down the line. This is what it says. <clears throat> Jesus has already told them a few things, but I'm... Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is of the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that ye are of Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because... My word hath no place in you. Now this is what Jesus found opposition to when he was talking to those Pharisees. <clears throat> I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now Jesus is making a difference. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. That's all the Jews probably yet today would like to claim is Abraham as their father. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto them or Jesus saith unto them if ye were Abraham's children ye would do the works of Abraham but now ye seek to kill me a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God which this did not Abraham then listen at this clause ye do the deeds of your father now they were not of God, so therefore they had to be of the devil. And I think he goes on here someplace and says, "Ye are of your father the devil. Verse 44, we'll get to that. <clears throat> they did not want to hear all of this. You know, the world today might not want to hear it if you go out and tell them, you are of your father the devil. Well, if you're not of God, if you're not born again, if you're not a saved individual, then you're not of God. If you're not of God, then who are you of? You're on Satan's side, so to speak. Let me read two more verses. <clears throat> if God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceed forth and come from God. Neither came I of myself, but he says he sent me. Now that's what the Pharisees and the Jewish people at that time didn't want to hear. Somewhere just back of this, I think in the seventh chapter, he says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And his own brethren didn't believe on him. <clears throat> so there's a lot of scriptures of people not believing the record. Now, if I was to not believe what Jesus said and what Jesus done and Jesus being here, this pages of the Bible would be obsolete because this is Jesus speaking with the people at that time. Now, that's a conversation, and it is by John the Apostle, one of the twelve that was chosen to be with Jesus all the time that he walked here from the time he was 33 years old on up through life, that they might be a witness of his death, burial, and resurrection, that he might even send them forth, that they might go out and preach the gospel. And the gospel they were supposed to preach was just what we're talking about to, to you right here now. <clears throat> it says, Why do you not understand my speech? I notice there's questions in here with question marks. Why do you not understand my speech? You know, I can just see Jesus there as I am before you people, only I believe there was a lot more of them, and they were all, possibly about all, standing there in opposition to what he was telling them. So why do you not understand my speech, he says. He gave them their answer, even because you cannot hear my word. Because they didn't hear it, they wouldn't accept it, Therefore, they were not doing what, they, 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 they would not hear the speech because they would not take heed to the words and 
try to put it in its perspective, believe it, and accept it. Then he goes on in verse 44. I used to quote this a lot, but I'm going to try to read it. It says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now that's what Jesus was telling those people at that time. Do you see why that they wanted to crucify him? Do you see why they wanted to get rid of him? He was telling them the truth, and he told them right there in his own words that you seek to kill me, and they even denied that. But they had already planned, I believe over here in the last part of the seventh chapter, it says, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? They, they had already found opposition, getting ready to try to get rid of him at the feast. They went up to the feast, and he wasn't there. They didn't know where he was at. But uh, he had already um, planned it to be that way, that they would seek him, but not find him. So he was there later, and of course they found him. <clears throat> and he said, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. See, Jesus was speaking with authority. He was speaking and telling them where it all came from. He did not, he says, he did not speak his own doctrine, but the doctrine of him that sent him. So he was teaching the people exactly what God wanted them to know. And he was a teacher sent from God to teach the people. He was the one that knew. He's the one that had come for the purpose. He had an obligation. He had a job to do. And he did speak his word. He spoke it boldly. He spoke it firmly. He had opposition when he did it. And they went about to kill him. They made their plans. They did kill him. They crucified him. If that's what you would say, killing him. They destroyed him, they thought. But God yet had a plan. And the plan was the resurrection. We'll go a little farther. Which of you convinces me of sin? With another question mark. In other words, ye, we be not born of fornication. In other words, they're saying to him, you were born of fornication. That's what I think it would relate to. Now, which one of you are going to prove this to be a fact? See, the New Testament scripture back in the third chapter of Luke tells us about how Jesus came into the world and all that through Mary and she was a virgin and all. So uh, he says, which of you convinces me of sin? Or which one of you has got evidence to show that I was actually born of fornication? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He was speaking the truth to the people, but they wasn't believing it. The word has went forth from that day forth, and there have been many people heard the word, but they have not believed the word. So therefore, they can be held accountable. Now, it's almost declared if you don't have no law then there is no sin because sin is a transgression of the law if you don't know what the lord requires of you you probably would not be in a light of being considered accountable but after you have heard and after you know what the lord requires and then if you don't accept that if you don't believe that if you reject that then you have to meet the consequences because the lord's already laid that out for you he that is of God heareth God's words. This is what Jesus is telling them. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Now this was Pharisees he was talking to. You know, we was talking this morning about the false religions. Pharisees were a false religion in that time. I don't know if you know that or not. But the Pharisees, they had their own laws. They started with the law of Moses, but they multiplied them. They added to them. And they come up with their own teachings. Jesus told them one time, I believe in the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew, he says, you teach for doctrine the commandments of men and make the commandments of God of none effect. In other words, they had revised the Old Testament, New T the Old Testament commandments and made them what they wanted them to be. And they went so far out that they really didn't know what the Old Testament commandments were because they were living by theirs. And you know, whenever we make our own laws, and I think we do to some extent, and we live by our laws, then we probably don't feel guilty because we made room for the justification to fit in and we're not considered ourselves guilty. <clears throat> I'll try not to keep you too long. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil? They put it in a question form. Did we not say well that you are a Samaritan? See, the Jews had no dealing with the Samaritans. Do you remember that statement? Well, the Samaritans, they was making him to be a Samaritan. In other words, the Samaritans were outcast people. They was putting Jesus as an outcast because they was indirectly saying that he was born of fornication. 
So that, that brings it all down to that point. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my Father, and ye do dishonor me. See, there's another place in the Scripture, in John's writing, I believe it says, if you receive not the Son, then you receive not the Father. You cannot, you can receive the Father, you can receive God as being God, but if you don't receive Christ as being the Son of God, then you don't have no salvation. The salvation came through believing that Jesus is the Son of God. So if you have the Son, then you have the Father also, it says. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Then he adds these two words that John only used, verily, verily. I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Now that, again, brought about trouble with those people. Now you see, they, they were trying to believe, they were trying, I think, to understand, but they was just too far out. They'd never come to the point to really know that all of the things that he was telling them could have been verified by Old Testament scriptures. But they had left the scriptures somewhat to live by their own rules. So we find here, then said the Jews unto him, and when you say Jews here, you're talking to people Jewish, but a lot of them were Pharisees because the Pharisees were the chief people of the Jews. <clears throat> then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? In other words, he said, If a man keeps his commandments and follows after his teaching, he should never taste of death. They was trying to contradict that. And they were contradicting it in a sense because Abraham did die. Uh, the prophets did die. But Jesus was greater than the prophets. That's what they had not understood. That's what they had not been able to grasp. Jesus answered, I honor, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say he is your God. See, they was claiming God. And the religions of the world today will claim that we're all serving the same God. Have you ever heard that? The religions of the world will tell you somewhat today that we're all serving the same God. Let's just all go along together and do this. <clears throat> Jesus, well, not Jesus. The Old Testament scripture, I don't know exactly where it says except. It says how can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, how could you have all the beliefs and all the teachings that are all over the world in religion today and bring them into one and make one out of them that would be able to get along? That's where I think the church stands out from the anti-church or the antichrist type of church because there are a singular separated people. <clears throat> Yet, ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Again, it brought him to an opposition. They said, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? See, they were just finding, they, they was looking for some way to criticize or contradict what he was making as a statement rather than to listen to it and try to make sense out of it. They were taking it and trying to find a way to down it, destroy it, not accept it, have no reason to accept it and all of that. So that's what all of this is about. But Jesus just keeps bringing it back to them, bringing it back. And I think when we... Uh, here it says, And he spake these words, many believed on him. You know, that's what makes believers is by hearing the Word of God, isn't it? It says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Then it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So they... Well, there were some people there that believed him, but that was more or less disciples, not necessarily the Jews, not necessarily the Pharisees. It was uh, probably just, well, he probably was about Jewish background somewhat, but they were not probably of some other religion. And if they were, you know, the Apostle Paul was of the Pharisee religion at one time. 
He was one of the strictest. He lived every bit of it just exactly as it was written. But what happened? One day he met the Lord on the way to Damascus and he was converted and he turned from that and then he persecuted. Well, before that he was persecuting the Christians. Now he's on the other side. You know, there's nothing wrong with changing sides to get from the bad side to the good side. But it would be something to get from the good side and go over to the bad side or the side of opposition, so to speak. But Jesus was very strong in his teaching, but he didn't really argue the points. He just told them what it was all about. And all they had to do was just listen, and it would finally come to a point. You know, like he told them on one occasion, he says, um, even as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Even after he was in the grave three days and rose the third day, there were still a lot of them around at that time that didn't believe it. And he had already told them it'll be just like that. But, you know, <clears throat> they, they didn't accept that. And I'm going to be closing here just a little bit for you. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. So Abraham was a man of old, and they realized that. But he said, Before Abraham was, I am. Well, that's where they needed to take the scripture that John wrote. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and all of that. If they would have went back and got a, a glimpse of all of this, then they could have understood that he was from the beginning. But they didn't do that. They found opposition. And then we have that same thing today a lot. <clears throat> you know, whenever you're trying to teach somebody and they find opposition with about everything that you try to teach, you're not really getting yourself anywhere. Even though Jesus did win over many of these, but they were a lot that had opposition and they couldn't seem to settle theirself and listen. You know, I think there's a scripture that says, By thy word thou art justified, and by thy word thou shalt be condemned. I believe these people were condemned because of their words, not because of their thinking, but because of their words. They, they was saying their own thing and it wasn't carrying through. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. He went out of the midst of them. He had already been there. He'd been spending time with them. He was teaching them and all of that. And you go into the ninth chapter of John, of course, you find out some more things that he did there where he healed or made the man that was blind. He was born blind and he made him to see and all of that. But this, again, found opposition. Once you go on through the ninth chapter, you can do the same thing. You can find where he made the statements. They found the opposition. He made the statements. They found the opposition. They were not listening. They were thinking. And we used to have one man in our Bible study, particularly on Wednesday night. We had three seats over here and I sat over there. We had... Uh, seats there, seats in the middle, seats I guess over here. He sat on the end of the middle row of seats pretty well across from me. They would ask me a question, teacher or whoever, he answered it. No matter what somebody else said, he'd find a way of modifying it, changing it, making it not right. Well, you know that gets old after a while. Teachers did not like to have somebody in their class that continually found opposition to what they were trying to say, continually answering questions that was asked specifically to somebody else. You know, if I ask somebody a question, that's the person I would like to answer it, not somebody else answer it for it. So that's the way I, I found it in the earlier days of church. Somebody is always there ready to fill some of these spaces. We would like to eliminate those kind of people so everybody in the church can have free access, free speech and all of that, and ready to say their own piece. Like I said in the beginning, if I ask somebody a question, I want to know what that person thinks. By knowing what that person thinks, then I might know more how to try to teach that person what I want them to know. So uh, when somebody else does the answering for you, it takes away that privilege, it takes away that bit that you would like to obtain. You know, I can sit down, and I, this is not a boast, I think it's just reality, and I can sit down and talk with people for a while, <clears throat> and the best way is when they don't realize it, but you can pretty well gather what they believe by the attitude of the way they say their words and their statements. You pretty well take, you know, they can be telling you loosely what they believe, but you can, by your good study of their 
thought and uh, their attitude and the way they say words, you can go a little bit deeper in there. And I believe the Lord gives people that much of an ability if they will take the advantage of it. And I think that, again, is just one of the gifts that some people have that maybe others don't. A good listener, a lot of times, will pick up and be able to tell you these things. But we have, uh, well, what was it Jesus said? They have ears to hear, but they hear not. They have eyes to see, and they see not. Well, there's a lot of people like that. They have the ears to hear, but they're like the Pharisees. They don't want to hear, they want to say. And um, I don't know, this could be considered jokingly, but it almost makes a good sense. He said that the Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. And the indication was he wanted us to do twice as much listening as he did talking. Now, does any of you ever hear that? That, that pretty near makes a sense. God did give us one mouth, and he gave us two ears. So if we do twice as much listening and half as much talking, chances are we'd both be better off. Now, that's not verified by anything I know of, but that was some man's opinion. But I started with that there. They said unto him, We be not born of fornication. No, these are the people that we can get to come into the church and make somebody more out of them. Because they feel and they are start off at the base, so to speak. They don't feel that they're above everybody else. But you get somebody that is maybe wealthy, somebody that has a great name, and then they want to be the top to start with, and it doesn't work. People, Jesus told them, except you be converted and become as little children, then you shall not enter into the kingdom. In other words, people need to realize that they're nothing until they're saved. Then they start growing from that time on. And the Apostle Peter made it pretty clear that he wanted his readers to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. So there's a lot of room for growth, but you've got to start as a little child. You know, I think a couple of times, three times back here, I mentioned something about the sincere milk of the Word. There's where we need to start is on the things that we can understand and learn those and teach those to new converts. And then after they have learned a few of those things, then they'll be able to understand other things that we try to teach. So we've been really, I think we do have one of our new converts here, but we have some that are not. And I was thinking maybe this morning we're going to have to send somebody out and see what happened. You know, we need to have new converts in the church to where they can be taught. And you can't learn too much too fast. You know, you've got to start, and then you've got to keep following through. So if you compare it to a natural food, you uh, probably wouldn't go too many hours without food. Well, in this realm of spirituality, I don't think we ought to go too many days without spiritual food. I think the Word of God will bring us closer to the Lord. Scripture does say, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. So if you draw nigh unto him through the preaching and the teaching of the word, then he'll be closer to you in your walk of life. And I, I like a lot of those little quotations. <clears throat> I like one over in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. It says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For they that come unto him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, that puts it pretty plain, doesn't it? Diligently seeking, not just haphazardly seeking, but diligently seeking Him. So I trust this morning that everybody here has become a believer. But I noticed Brother Jack had a song of invitation. I believe Brother Aaron requested. I don't know how it came about. But it, <clears throat> I think we ought to close with a song of invitation. <clears throat> We have found out that there have been unsaved people here and we didn't even realize it. And then whenever they're saved, it makes you wonder, maybe we should have been a little bit more persuasive. Brother